Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Tuesday, December 8th, 2020. Today, a member of the Pentagon Advisory Board has resigned in protest of the recent purge. Biden announces his health team. We learn that the Trump administration passed when Pfizer offered to sell additional doses of the vaccine to the U.S. this past summer, and now we may not be able to get more vaccine from them until June because commitments to other countries. Bill Barr is contemplating leaving the administration before January 20th. Former Florida Board of Health scientist has her home raided by police with guns drawn. SCOTUS refuses to overturn the ruling, allowing students to use the bathroom aligned with their gender identity. Pompeo returns to Kansas to ponder his political future, what's left of it. And the Michigan Secretary of State is met with armed protesters outside her home. I'm your host, A.G. And I'm Dana Goldberg. All right, that is a lot of news today, Dana. <laughs> it is. It is. And we just got started. That was actually just the rundown of what's about to happen. <laughs> So you can probably just listen to that if you already know the stories <laughs> uh, and then be, be done with your day. Um, so first of all, we're going to talk today with uh, former federal state prosecutor Ellie Honig about Bill Barr contemplating leaving the Justice Department early. I'm super sad about that. I'm not. Um, we're also going to be talking about um, the violent rhetoric that's coming from the right and some of the consequences of that, including what's happening at Joc- Jocelyn Benson's home. It's horrifying. She's the Michigan Secretary of State. And what happened to Rebecca Jones today? She's the former Florida Board of Health employee who was keeping track of COVID numbers and they told her to lie about it and she refused and they fired her. And so she was doing it from her home. They raided her home this morning with guns drawn on her children. Ugh. Um and so that is just out of some other century in some other country. And we're going to talk to Frank about that. Uh, we do have the good news after that, which we will need. Yeah. And coming up in a couple weeks here, we're going to be participating, I think, uh, in a fundraising contest for Georgia um, for the Senate runoff races. And we're going to have a friendly competition uh, between us and a couple of other podcasts that you probably know. So I just wanted everyone to be prepared for that. Uh, whoever raises the most money gets bragging rights, really. Uh, but all the money goes to um, Warnock and Ossoff in their runoff races in Georgia because it's very important that we secure the Senate. Now, since Lindsey Graham has come out today, which wasn't in the headlines, but he has come out today and said he that the, the, the Senate will not confirm any attorney general that will prosecute Trump. He's such a piece of shit. And you can decide who you think I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so that's illegal. Um, now, and remember, Dana, remember the story we did yesterday about the Pentagon Advisory Board being ousted and replaced with people like Corey Lewandowski and David Bossie? Yeah, that story from 15 years ago that you said yesterday. Mm-hmm. I do remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it was yesterday. It could have been a year ago. Well, it was definitely yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Blank, and that's his name. It's not redacted. Steve Blank, <laughs> a, a member of the Defense Business Board, has resigned in protest over that move, saying in his letter of resignation that the abrupt termination of more than half of the Defense Business Board and their replacement with political partisans has now put the nation's safety and security at risk. So that's an, an important distinction from from somebody who's now resigning in protest. Oh, and I just learned that Biden will announce his Secretary of Defense and his Attorney General picks this week. So where are your beans? Where are your beans? I want to know where your beans are, AG. I want people to hear them now so we can see if you're right. I want either Michelle Flournoy. I, I I want Michelle Flournoy at, as the Secretary of Defense. Um, I don't know if that's my beans or not. It might be Jay Johnson, Attorney General. He's he seems to be leaning towards Tom Perez. I hope that's not the case. I really hope that's not the case. Oh God, I'm sorry. I've, that's the first I've heard of that, and I really hope that's not the case too. Uh, I prefer either Sally Yates or yes, yeah, or. Adam Schiff. That would be my dream come true. I don't think they'll put him there, though. It's pretty partisan uh, of them to do. Uh, For sure. But I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, I don't fucking care. And don't recuse yourself, Adam. Let's act like Republicans. Not after what we just went through for four years. I agree with you. I would love to see Yates in that position. Yeah. I mean, for several reasons. She's fucking brilliant. She's also very nice to look at if you're a lady who is into ladies. (laughs) She's absolutely wonderful. (laughs) I would actually like Holly Hunter as Sally Yates. 
to be the attorney general. Absolutely. Though I, that takes away from Sally Yates' gorgiosity, which she has in, in spades. So, uh, but she's my hero. Yes. You know, she was, it's, it's, it's common for an attorney general like Bill Barr to resign and leave the um, deputy attorney general in place while they figure out, while the new administration, fi- you know, put gets con- confirmation on their new attorney general. And that's what happened in 2016 with Sally Yates. And she was there, and then uh, Trump tried to do the Muslim ban, and she's like, I'm fucking, I quit, fuck you. And she she's amazing, she's strong. I've watched her testify in sham hearings a million times, and she's fantastic, and she would be wonderful. Um, All right, we have a lot to talk about, so. yeah. A lot. Let's get into it. Yeah, let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right, the lead story today is a stunning report from the New York Times. This goes, file this in the category of Trump was installed to destroy us. Because (laughs) once you sort of uh, understand that that is what the reality is, everything kind of becomes clear. Everyone's motives become clear. So New York Times says that the Trump administration officials passed. They took a pass when Pfizer offered in late summer to sell the U.S. government additional doses of its COVID-19 vaccine. This is according to people familiar with the matter. Now, Pfizer may not be able to provide more of its vaccine to the United States until next June because of its commitments to other countries. Britain plans to begin vaccination drive on Tuesday using the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, making it the first Western nation to start mass vaccinations. Could have been us. It's Britain. No offense. I just, you know, we could also be doing this now had Trump right. not passed in June. Exactly. <laughs> On November 11th, two days after Pfizer first announced early results indicating its vaccine was more than 90% effective, the European Union announced that it had finalized a supply deal with Pfizer and BioNTech for 200 million doses, a deal they began negotiating in months earlier. Shipments could begin by the end of the year, and the contract includes an option for 100 million more doses because the EU was on it and we were not. As the administration scrambles to try to purchase more doses, President Trump plans on Tuesday to sign an executive order that will ensure the United States government prioritizes getting the vaccine to American citizens before sending it to other nations. He's just going to say that on a piece of paper and hope it happens. And this is according to a draft statement from a White House official. It is not immediately clear, New York Times says, what force the president's executive order would carry. Let me answer that for you, New York Times. None. Zero. (laughs) It's not going to do anything. Uh, 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 We want it first. Love, Donald Trump. Can we have the vaccine first? Check this box. Yes, no, maybe. And, I, you know, I would bet money, AG, why this dick move happened. And, I mean, I'm sure, it, who knows if it's said in this article, um, but it, Pfizer wasn't involved in the government funding to find a vaccine, which means Trump wasn't financially tied to this company. So, of course, when they were like, hey, we're going to give you some extra, va- you know, we've got vaccines for you. you got to buy in from us. Trump was like, no, 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 we're good, we're good, we're good. I'm sure he was waiting, hoping that the other ones that he did have financial stake in came out with the vaccine sooner so he could just get his money back. Yeah, or that, or the ones that Operation Warp Speed was working with. Exactly. He, and he lost the bet, and so now he's the loser, and he doesn't want to lose. So he said, no, we don't need your crappy vaccine we've got these other ones from my pillow guy and total landscaping so here we are (laughs) who knew someone that made pillows would be this so disgusting (laughs) he's really a horrible human being yeah i was thinking the other day you know how when uh, trump was elected and we're like he's not my president not my president right Mm -hmm. um i'm i i I say that he is not my pillow guy that guy is not my pillow guy he's not my pillow guy he's your pillow guy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I still Not go yours. back to those poor lesbians that wrote in when I first started the show like we've been sleeping on a Trump mattress for years and I'm like you poor things oh you poor things oh speaking of despicable people uh, Mike Pompeo who spent four years overseeing the Trump administration's foreign intelligence and international relations apparatus plans to move back to Kansas. Kansas, I am so terribly sorry, where supporters and observers say he is well-positioned for domestic political pursuits. (sighs) 
it's just so infuriating that apparently if you steal money from the, the public and don't know how to do your fucking job, you can actually move back to Kansas and he's probably going to end up running for Congress again. Uh, in an interview at his state department office, Mr. Pompeo said he and his wife, Susan aim to return at some point to Kansas to be with friends, family, and their church community <laughs> as a, <laughs> as a congressman. He represented, um, if you follow, if you followed him, I don't know why you would before he became part of this administration, but he represented the state's fourth district, uh, for six years. He was in that position for six years. And now during the last weeks of the Trump administration, the secretary of state declined to rule out possible future runs for office saying he's focused on his current job. Really? Are you Mike? Are you? Mm. Um, and hasn't thought much (laughs) about what's next, but longtime supporters of Pompeo, uh, leveraging, they actually see him leveraging his national and international stature for a future run for governor, U S Senator, or one day president or vice president, listen, Pompeo, (laughs) just because Donald was somehow able to get this position does not mean every idiot out there can actually, actually, that's not true because all the QAnons that won their um, congressional Mm. races, but you know, AG, I'm starting to want, you know, I used to think I wasn't smart enough to run for political office. And then I saw like that blonde QAnon woman win her district. And I was like, oh, no, I'm okay. I might be overqualified. Yeah, but you'd have to move to a place where you could win that. Right. Because if I ran where I'm at, I'd actually be running against Ted Lieu, and I wouldn't want to do that anyway. No, right? Like, I was like, yeah, I want to run for office. All the people who want to run for office, you look around your city council, you're like, everyone's pretty badass. Oh, our senators are pretty good. Damn. uh, My representatives are great, too. Eh. Uh. (laughs) Now I guess I'll be president of the Chuckle Hut for a while until... Take over the magic place, the, the mag- magic castle, the magic castle they, until something else They're all else in trouble. <laughs> they're uh. all in trouble for sexual harassment and sexual conduct and misconduct and shit. Oh, my God. People, bodies being found in closets. I'm like, what is happening? It's it's magic. It okay. Is, yeah. that, um, dis- that disappearing act, they could only do it once and it just didn't go well. Sorry, that's a terrible joke. Uh, there, here's some good news, though. Joe Biden has announced his health team. It's amazing. We already talked about uh, Javier Becerra. He's going to be the Health and Human Services Secretary. We know he's he's the uh, he was the Attorney General here in California. Uh, Doctor Vivek Murthy uh, for Surgeon General, which is awesome. I love him. Uh, Doctor Rochelle Walensky as the Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Doctor Fauci uh, is being tapped to be the Chief Medical Advisor. I don't think that's a confirming uh, something that has to be confirmed by the Senate. I think that just goes through. Um, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith for the COVID-19 Equity Task Force. We're going to have an equity task force for COVID-19. Thank God. That's amazing and incredible because it has just been totally ignored. And I don't know if you know this, I had an interview with Olivia Troy who was on the task force. And, you know, they were getting all these data in saying that, you know, communities of color were being harshly impacted by COVID. And the the Trump administration was like, well, let's just put black guy Jerome Adams at the table and black guy Ben Carson at the table, and that'll make it look like we care and we won't do actually anything else about it. And they and Jerome knew, Jerome Powell knew he was being uh, used. Jerome Powell? No. Jerome Adams? Jerome Powell is the Fed chair. Let me make sure I'm getting this right. Surgeon General. I wish I could be the one to correct you, and I'm just not that girl. Surgeon General Jerome Adams. I was right. Dr. Adams. Go. Okay. Not your own pal. He's Fed chair. Uh, at the, he knew he was being tokenized to sit at that table to make it look like there was concern. And 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 that embarrassed. It was so hard for Olivia Troy because she had to make the table setting cards, you know, or put the table setting cards out. And, right. And it was known that that's what was happening. So we now have a full on equity task force and it's going to be headed up by Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith. And I'm so excited about that. And then, um, uh, uh, Jeff Zients as the COVID response coordinator. So that's going to be great. I'm just so glad we have a team of science, like people that actually believe in science and actually believe in what the CDC director was going to say. And, you know, Dr. Fauci and they'll, I have so much hope. I have so much hope for this new administration with this pandemic. I just cannot wait till January 20th, 21st, I guess, when he gets to work. But, ugh, oy. Well, some good news that actually surprised me, AG, and I think this will probably surprise some of our listeners. Um, just because our Supreme Court is leaning so far to the right that it's just drunk and time to come home from the bar. Um, 
I just, this actually surprised me. The U.S. Supreme Court on Monday, they rejected a request to hear a case challenging an Oregon high school's policy allowing transgender students to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. So for those people that that may sound a little confusing, there was a case that went through in Oregon that said transgender students can use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity, not with the uh, sex assigned, the gender assigned to them at birth, uh, which is a huge deal. Before I get into the story, I, it's just things that people don't think about. And I know this is going to sound menial to some, and maybe it'll actually be impactful to others. There's kids out there, transgender kids that no longer eat or drink water during school time hours because they're afraid they're going to have to use the bathroom. They would rather dehydrate themselves. And all of us know as adults and those that pay attention, that can lead to so many things, including an inability to think straight. I mean, think about the last time you were dehydrated. There's nothing that you could actually function in a way that was positive. So there's so, there's so many things about this that are, that are great about this, um, this um, case in Oregon. Yeah, that has to be mentally traumatizing. Yes. And then also the, the physiology of, of not eating and not drinking yeah. water. Uh, it's horrifying. Um, so, but the petition filed by the advocacy group Parents for Privacy, which is the, the stupidest thing I've ever heard. If it's Parents for Privacy, why don't you stay the fuck out of the bathrooms? I mean... <laughs> Okay. Okay. The petition filed by the advocacy they're, they're group. They're helicopter parents, but for genitals. Oh my God. Parents for Privacy was rejected, rejected by the justices without comment, leaving in place a lower court ruling, which held that the district's policy did not impinge on a parent's child rearing rights or student's privacy rights. This is a big deal. So the case was uh, Parents for Privacy versus you know, Bill Barr. Uh, and it stems from a 2017 lawsuit filed after the Dallas school district number two put in place the anti-discrimination bathroom and locker room policies. Now these protect our kids. Portland based U S district judge Marco A. Hernandez dismissed the action in 2018. And that led the parents to file an appeal with the ninth circuit. So a three judge panel on the circuit court confirmed, excuse me, <clears throat> affirmed Hernandez's ruling in February concluding that the 14th Amendment did not provide viable privacy claims for either parents or students to challenge the policy. It's a good thing. Yes, while we agree, the district court and hold that there is no 14th Amendment fundamental privacy right to avoid all risk or intimate exposure to or by a transgender person who has assigned the opposite biological sex at birth. Now, Judge Wallace uh, Tashima, Judge A. Wallace Chishima wrote a 55-page opinion that SCOTUS chose not to review. This really just does surprise me with you've got these assholes up there like Kavanaugh and now Amy Coney Barrett, who they have their opinions about this. We've heard them publicly. So, um, and in quotes, we also hold that a policy that treats all students equally does not discriminate based on sex in violation of title nine. And that the normal use of privacy facilities does not constitute actionable sexual harassment under title nine, just because a person is transgender, which is a horrible falsity and that the people use to try and, um, back up their bigotry basically. Um, I just want you all to know, listening, that there's never been a case where a, a transgender person has actually uh, been the person uh, to um, commit a crime in a bathroom. It's always been the person where a crime was committed against in a bathroom. In fact, more Republican senators have committed crimes in bathrooms than any transgender people in this country. <laughs> I have a wide stance. Yes. Now, continue this quote. We hold further that the 14th Amendment does not provide a fundamental parental right to determine the bathroom policies of the public mm. schools to which parents may send their children. Yes, either independent or of the parental right. You say that again because I'm sure people listening were like, what? Either independent of the parental right to direct the upbringing and education of their children or or encompassed by it. Finally, we hold that the school district's policy is rationally related to a legitimate state purpose and does not infringe plaintiff's First Amendment's free exercise rights because it does not target religious conduct. Thank you. I mean, every time this happens, I was shocked before Amy Coney Barrett went in and they actually upheld, you know, Kavanaugh, it, mm. his, his vote just to protect LGBTQ people in the workplace shocked me. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and this one also surprises me, but all I can do is thank the stars and let's move on, you know, make sure our kids are protected. I just hope there's a bunch of assholes who donated dark money to the Federalist Society to get these kinds of things overturned that just, just writhing their hands in their little angry houses of hate. I just fuck. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That is good news. And, and again, surprising and pleasantly surprising uh, from from this supreme court all right we'll be right back with ellie honig we're going to discuss bill barr's potential early departure yay and later i have a terrifying story about the former florida department of health scientist rebecca jones and an armed raid on her home and what's going on outside of jocelyn benson's house secretary of state in michigan i'm going to be talking with frank faglizzi about that in a piece he did for msnbc daily we'll be right back after these messages we'll be right back Hey everybody, it's AG, and today's episode of The Daily Beans is brought to you by Plush Care. Now, more than ever, you should not put off seeing a doctor when you're not feeling well. I know that with everything going on, it can be difficult to put your health first, but that's why I use Plush Care. Plush Care provides primary and urgent health care through virtual appointments. And scheduling an appointment, even for the same day, is super easy. I just pick the slot, click, click, book it online, magic. So I don't waste time on hold. I don't have to go to crowded waiting rooms. And with Plush Care and my membership, I can see my doctor from the comfort of my own home, even in my PJs. And with Plush Care, I can get diagnosed, treated, and even have a prescription sent to my local pharmacy if needed, all within minutes. And if I have any questions before or after my visit, I can send unlimited messages to my care team anytime. Plus, Plush Care accepts most major insurance carriers, and it's available in all 50 states. And with how difficult things are, if you're feeling anxious or depressed or stressed about what's going on in the world, Plush Care doctors are there to help by discussing treatment options and providing prescriptions as needed. I can tell you, personally, my Plush Care experience has been a breeze. Again, signing up was super easy. It's very user-friendly. It only takes a minute, and it's just as easy to schedule an appointment. The entire process has been so convenient. I was immediately comfortable and felt confident with my my doctor too because all plush care doctors graduated from one of the top 50 medical schools in the country and they're highly rated by their patients so i have peace of mind that i'm getting the highest quality health care so plush care makes it easy for me to get the excellent care i need when i need it with plush care i don't put off seeing a doctor and neither should you no more excuses so make your appointment today go to plushcare.com slash daily beans that's p-l-u-s-h-c-a-r-e.com slash daily beans plushcare.com slash daily beans All right, everybody, welcome back. Attorney General William Pelham Barr is considering stepping down before President Trump's term ends next month. And this is according to three people familiar with his thinking. One said Mr. Barr could announce his departure before the end of the year, making 2020 not a total shit show. And joining me today to talk about the possible motives is former state and federal prosecutor and author of the forthcoming book about Bill Barr called Hatchet Man, How Bill Barr Broke the Prosecutor's Code and Corrupted the Justice Department, due out next summer. Ellie Honig. Ellie, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Allison. So first of all, I want to wish you a happy safe harbor day. <laughs> uh, given, yeah, right? I mean, not to be glib about Pearl Harbor. Obviously, it's one of the most important. But Pearl Harbor Day is, is December 7th, mm-hmm. of course. This year, December 8th is actually safe harbor day, which is under our election laws. It, it varies every four years. It's the you know, Monday after the second Wednesday in December or something under the federal law. But But basically what it means is all these election lawsuits are, are are done because now whatever the states have certified by December 8th essentially cannot be challenged. Now, I'm sure Rudy and, and people, when he feels better, are still going to file lawsuits, but they're going to have even less of a chance and they never really had a chance to begin with. Mm. So I think I think we can take some finality out of this year's Safe Harbor Day, December 8th. Mm-hmm. And lawyers across the country are filing complaints with the bar various bar associations about the conduct of the elite strike force that'll be interesting to see what happens and then of course you know safe harbor day we had judge alito scheduling uh filings due uh on december 9th and then he redid that and said they were due today yeah. because he was like i don't want to make it look like i'm putting it off until after safe harbor day <laughs> exactly it's like yeah yeah what, what you know we close at five o'clock but come on in for your interview at five thirty, right it was a little bit of that <laughs> like you have no chance so i think he's at least wants to make it look like okay you know it's due it's due on <laughs> on safe harbor day at 9 a.m so i can reject you on so even alito i believe is going to reject them fairly quickly yeah so it'll be unanimous uh yeah and and yeah, yeah the be like you turn in your filings November 34th and we'll right, have we'll exactly. have discussions. Uh so exactly. you know we'll let everybody know what happens then. So what do you think yes, is Bar. going on here because there's this could have a lot of different 
implications, some major, some not so major. But, you know, the the New York Times article doesn't really go into, they say, you know, this is according to Bill Barr's thinking, he's thinking of leaving early, but it doesn't say what his reasons are. So I, it would all just be speculation at this point. Yeah. So look, obviously, we can't know what's going on inside Bill Barr's head. But I think there's there's plenty of reasonable assumptions we can draw. So first of all, let's just... This is just who's going to dump who first as between Trump and Barr, right? It's like it's like in a boyfriend girlfriend breakup and oh well I dumped her. No, she no, he, I dumped him first. Um we we've definitely got that dynamic going here and we're really just talking about posturing for for sort of future posterity's sake. I mean, if Bill Barr leaves on December making up a date 22nd or January 20th, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's not like there's that much he can or will do in that last month. So we're, we're really just sort of posturing here. Here's what I think is going on with Bill Barr. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's what I think is going on with Bill Barr. First of all, the whole fallout they've had has been really over two things. Donald Trump is PO'd that Bill Barr did not deliver a, a stunning October surprise for him on the Durham report. And that Bill Barr obviously came out last week and said, DOJ has found no uh, no evidence of widespread election fraud. Those are the two things that are making Donald Trump crazy. Why did Bill Barr do those things? I I believe it's pretty clear because he had nothing at all to work with, right? It's clear to me the Durham report is going to end up a dud. It's not going to turn up the big names that Donald Trump in his sort of fever dreams is hoping for, or if it does, not in time for the election. And the whole election fraud thing, there's just no there there. And William Barr has shown us throughout his two years in office that he is absolutely willing, eager, and able to twist facts, to distort facts, to to twist the law, to distort the law. But you know what? You can't make something out of nothing. I mean, the guy's not a wizard. He can't conjure facts where there are none. So now I'm, now I'm envisioning him in a wizard outfit. <laughs> yeah, with one of those pointy hats with stars and moons on it and stuff. <laughs> it kind of works. Kind of works Definitely. for him, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually he kind of does fit the role, um, but he just can't do it. Now, Donald Trump doesn't understand, I don't think, this notion of, look, I, I can I can fudge things, but I can't manufacture things. So what's Bill Barr thinking? I think I think he's trying to do a couple things here. Number one, I think he's trying to go out on a good note. Look, Bill Barr is I will I will submit smarter than your average sort of starry eyed Trump, you know, sycophant. Uh, who's around him and just, you know, worships the ground he walks on. Bill Barr is smarter than that. And I think Bill Barr realized probably on November 3rd or certainly by November 4th or 5th that this election was over and wasn't going to be flipped and wasn't going to be flippable. And so in a rational person's mind, Bill Barr certainly is a rational, self-interested person. You got to think, OK, now I'm an end game and I have really two choices. I can cast them in with the Rudys and the Jenna Ellis's and the other pretenders and, and, you know, wild sort of bomb throwers out there, or I can try to save some face. Right. And I think he made a fairly rational choice of, look, my future is not sort of in Donald Trump land. My future is in being a respected person who can maybe go back to a law firm, who can be respected on the speaker circuit. And I think he realized that there's some benefit to him in, in making some distance here. I will also say, Whatever his reasoning was, and, and I want to get to, to sort of one other reason, he did do the right thing when he spoke out last week and said, no, we have not found evidence of voter fraud. And the thing is, he did not have to say anything. He could have just left it out there and let Trump keep on yammering about election fraud, and Trump's going to keep yammering anyway. But he affirmatively chose to come out and make that kind of statement when he didn't have to do that. So I, I do give him – some credit for that. But here's my sort of more cynical view of what I think Barr is trying to do. He's trying to finish on a good note. And I think he's hoping that because of what is it, primacy, recent, recency, right? The human psychological tendency to remember what came last the most, that that will sort of whitewash and, and put, in, put in a softer lens all of the malfeasance of the prior two years. And so I, I just want to stress for your audience, do not, even if he goes out resigning. And even if he goes out on a note of principle, that by no means cancels out or reduces the damage that he's done over two straight years of corrupt and abuse of power, uh, corruption and abuse of power. So 
Um, I think he's trying to sort of go off in a nice flourish that that really will change the way we look at his, his tenure, but we should not. Yeah, I'm not falling for it. And I'm glad your book's coming out after he goes. Um, <clears throat> now, yeah. You're right. I mean, he he appointed Durham, looked into stuff for over a year. They found, you know, he had the the Department of Justice IG all over this. And first of all, I've worked for the government for a long time. You've worked for the government for a long time. If you want to find something on somebody, if you want to find mistakes and problems, they're easy to find. Uh, it's impossible to to live a completely error free life working for the United States federal government, uh, and and so that all he could come up with was the Klein Smith email that that uh, Carter Page wasn't a CIA asset, and you know some of the mm-hmm. findings that um, the Inspector General Horowitz from the Department of Justice came out with, just shows, and we've said this the whole time, they have. Nothing. And that's why they didn't release a report before the election, not because it was within 60 days of the election, because Bill Barr came out and said, we aren't going to follow that rule anymore. It's because they didn't have anything and they will continue to not have anything. And I don't think Biden should fire him, even though he can't be a special counsel because he doesn't he works within the government and special special counsels have to come. Specials counsel have to (laughs) have to come from outside (laughs) the government. Uh, But here's my question. I know if he leaves by the end of the year, it only leaves a few weeks to a month, maybe. Maybe if he leaves of of a barless era. And I think Rosen would probably be the acting uh, attorney general uh, until the leave. I wonder if this leaves Trump vulnerable um, to maybe the uh, some attorney attorneys general pick back up any cases that they were keeping on the down low. Um, And then, you know, the other idea, too, is this Department of Justice Inspector General Horowitz, I believe, has been kept from releasing certain Inspector General reports on investigations he did, for example, the New York FBI field office that was supposed to come out over a year ago, wondering if those could then be free to to come out or start back up again ahead of Biden taking over the department. Yes. So um, I I think you're right that that Jeffrey Rosen, who's the current deputy attorney general, the number two person would take over. That's the normal sort of circle of life. And and in fact, normally the AG uh, resigns on January 20th and, and then his or her deputy takes over even into the next administration. And we saw that in 2016 when Sally Yates, exactly. So that's sort of normal um, circle of life, I guess. What I think is probably happening at U.S. attorney's offices, and this is just based on my own time there and knowing people who used to be U.S. attorneys, is any office that has an investigation that they think may be politically sensitive, something that Bar or his ilk may try to stomp out or, or you know, officially decline, which would make it much harder to bring it later. I think at this point, you're just sort of sitting on the ball. You're just I'm not saying you're misleading the main justice. You're just your 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 frequency of phone calls, your updates to them are going to get more and more infrequent. And you're just going to try to hold steady, hold the course, not do anything dramatic in the public, not ex- go execute any big search warrants or anything like that. Just hold down the fort until the next AG comes in. It's right around the corner. And whoever out of the rumored folks out there is going to take over for for, um, take over justice under a Biden administration is going to, I believe, be way more independent than Bill Barr has been way less uh, sort of politically directed than Bill Barr has been. So I think at this point you want to you want to preserve and conserve your investigations, even if you're a U.S. attorney and you know you're about to resign or be replaced, which is also very normal at around this starting around this time. I think you just want to hold steady and lay low and sort of not be a squeaky wheel and not draw any attention from main justice. And, and yeah, I think Bill Barr leaving will 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 maybe make that a little easier. There will be more sort of discord in the front office. And, and you know, I mean, Rosen is not really you know, I don't I don't have high faith in in Rosen either. But um I think that's the strategy, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see if anything comes out from Horowitz. Mm -hmm. Um, That's kind of where, yeah, because I'm with you. Rosen's in charge. You still just sort of lay low. Uh, If that's what's happening, that's speculative. Um, But, uh, you know, we get to the the point where we talk about the Department of Justice Inspector General, who has, I think, definitely uh, been laying low uh, and, and not sticking his neck out because we've seen sort of what's happened with a lot of other inspectors general under this administration. So who knows? Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think the IG, look, the IG has, first of all, Michael Horowitz, I think, has done a very good job. I credit his findings, you know, whichever side loves or hates them. And by the way, he's made findings that the sort of left side, the liberal side, the Democrats don't like. And he's made findings that 
the conservatives, the right side, the Republicans don't like. I think he's been really right down the middle. And I also think he's very high on the list of people who could get fired by the president mm. in the next six seven weeks. Mm. Um, you know, not not to play sort of parlor games with people's careers, but he has come to conclusions that Donald Trump and Bill Barr have really disliked. Mm. And we've already seen President Trump on a sort of retributive firing spree that he started in the Department of Defense. And, and I, I see no reason to think it's going to stop. And so Michael Horowitz could be on that list. Yeah. And you and I know uh, we're familiar with inspectors general and their investigations. And it, when a, when an inspector general does an investigation, never ever in the history of inspector general investigations has any, any inspector general come back and said, I didn't find anything wrong. Everything's great. Uh, it's again, it's one of those things where if you, if you, ins if you inspect something, uh, you're going to find something and that's just, that's just the, the nature of the beast. And so what, what it really boils down to is who is telling the inspector general to investigate what, right? And so when we, when all of the investigations are very pointed, uh, then those are, you know, they're going to get back reports that find some wrongdoing, and then they're going to grab onto those little pieces. But there were definitely uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, absolutions with this uh, inspector general too, just like you said that 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 Trump was not uh, pleased with, but ha and and had to work to spin in his favor. So that's kind of how how that whole inspector general situation works. Yeah, I mean, one one of the the things that I talk about in my book, Bill Barr in particular, uh, showed not just a lack of sort of respect for the inspector general, but he broke the rules when Michael Horowitz announced his findings on the origins of the Russia investigation, which, by the way. We're not unequivocal either way. He said there was an awful lot of errors. He said, I don't have proof that they were politically motivated necessarily, but there were there were several errors. Like you say, AG, though, there's always going to be errors. The more complex the matter, the more you dive in, the more you're going to find errors. But Bill Barr then made a public statement basically saying in so many words, oh, I disagree. And I think what I've seen, we're going to find a lot of bad stuff here. First of all, you never, any prosecutor worth, worth a hill of beans knows you never comment publicly on a pending investigation and you never, ever comment about the substance. I mean, Bill Barr basically said, well, I disagree. How do you know, Bill Barr, first of all? I mean, you know, Horowitz releases this nuanced, detailed report. So it's just one of many examples of Bill Barr breaking, not just bending, but breaking DOJ's and forget about the unwritten rules. He broke plenty of them, but a written DOJ rule just because it was politically expedient. And, and that's the kind of thing. Let's remember, that's a that's probably 18th, 30th on the list of uh, of things that Bill Barr did that were damaging and harmful to DOJ during his tenure. So even if he tries to go out as this great principled objector, uh, don't buy it. Yeah, 100 percent. And how can people this is going to be a fascinating book. I can't wait to read it. How can people support the release of this book? Can people pre-order it or or say they want to? How's it going? Where, where can they do that? Yeah, it's coming out in July. Uh, I know it's a far, a little bit a, a ways away, but I don't know. I guess that's the reality of the publishing world. But it, it is available right now on Amazon.com. If you just put in my name, Ellie Honig, I am the only Ellie Honig on Amazon, probably in the world, now that I think of it. Um, <laughs> it's the benefit of having an unusual name, and the, it's called Hatchet Man, How Bill Barr Broke the Prosecutor's Code and Corrupted the Justice Department. And I sort of go through, what I do is I, I go through his own his two years of, of sort of uh, of corruption and, and self-dealing and politicization of DOJ. But I contrast it to my own experience at DOJ. And there's a lot of war stories in there. Lessons I learned from being in the trenches, from trying cases about the right way DOJ should run, the way I was taught at the SDNY. Uh, a lot of courtroom stories, mob stories, war stories, usually involving me screwing something up and learning a lesson. <laughs> um, and saying, basically, let's remember, Bill Barr, the guy never tried a case as a prosecutor in his life. And same goes for Rosen and same goes for several other top brass. And I say, basically, my argument is this guy was never able to do the job, A, because he was crooked and B, because he never learned the right way. And he just got sort of airlifted into the top of the department. I know it's his second time being AG, but both times. Um, and that's what really caused him uh, – to be such a bad and, and political and, and I believe corrupt AG. And by the way, I have a little bit of a surprise ending and, uh, on a theory of why he did what he did, but I'll save that for now. <laughs> I found some old stuff. I found some old stuff that he said and did that I think is very telling as to his mindset. I'll put it that way. Oh, interesting. Well, I look forward to it. 
Um, Teaser. Yeah. <laughs> everybody check that out. I have a, I just have a little bit of a feeling that that even though Rosen by the Vacancies Act is supposed to take over, I think Trump's going to try to shove Bossy in there or something. Just I just oh my goodness. have a feeling he's going to try to do some shit. I mean, we already have uh, an illegally appointed secretary of the De- Department of Homeland Security. So why not? You know, why not send Bossy over or something? Well, wait. OK, let's play a game. Let's play a game. I challenge you. Ready? Uh-huh. Let's each try to come up with the person who the president could put in for the next six weeks if Barr is to leave. That would be most outrageous. But you can't pick like, you know, it can't be a convict. Let's say it can't be someone who's been convicted of a crime. But short of that. Well, that's like nobody. That leaves, I've got to, right. <laughs> that leaves no one. <laughs> I understand that limits the pool quite a bit. Um, OK, I've got my person. OK, who, who do you got? Matt Gates. Oh, How about that? <laughs> That beat, be beat that i will beat that i will ted cruz <laughs> okay that's that's a tie we now tie. he's not going to take anybody out of the senate he's not going to take anybody no, out of the senate. Exactly. i know that's true that's true. uh let's see uh roy moore no um oh no he's been convicted yeah, yeah. oh no no i guess just accused no but... yeah uh i don't and he uh, that's doesn't why like... you can't say like arpaio or one of these guys because they've been convicted i know they were pardoned but uh, yeah. I mean, Bossy is strong, but that's not super outrageous. Um, no, no. Maybe he puts. Maybe he puts. <laughs> Jared. <laughs> I was thinking Matthew fucking Whitaker, but like he's already done that, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, it's funny in, in doing the research for this book, I went back through the Whitaker years and it was just like, did that, and not years, it was a couple months. Did this really happen? I mean, this guy is, is worse than you even realize. I mean, you know, remember the whole thing where like he was part of a scam with low, low hanging toilets for extra endowed men Oh yeah, that was investigated by the FEC. Mm-hmm. And then the, the guy was just like, the things he did and said um, were so insane. And I actually, at one point, I was talking to one of my research assistants. I said, let's try, what are the things that Matthew Whitaker actually did? Like, did he do any cases? Did he do any uh, announcements? Was there anything of substance? And the only thing we could find of any import was when he was doing an announcement about some totally unrelated case, and he blurted out at the end that Mueller was almost finished with his investigation, which is the stupidest thing you could, now look, maybe it was intentional, but intentional or not, there's no better way to, to totally undermine an investigation than to announce you're almost done, right? All your witnesses are going to try to run out the clock. Who's going to cooperate? So that was about the only thing he did in, in three months of any substance, and it was a total debacle. Yeah, we nicknamed him Big Dick Toilet Wine because we had mused how much oh, okay. hooch, how much prison hooch he could make in one of his well-endowed toilets while uh, serving time in prison. Um, yeah, well, uh, memorable AG right there. I'm gonna go. I, I'm gonna go with somebody from Elite Strike Force. I'm gonna go with either Bossy or Rudy. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Jenna Ellis. That would have oh, no. <laughs> oh. Um. By the way, great piece in the New York Times this weekend about Jenna Ellis. Uh, I'll just kindly say, perhaps overstating her credentials. Oh yeah, she used to work in traffic ticket court. Yeah, I mean, check mm-hmm. it out. Um, she mm-hmm. once I once did a segment on on CNN with her when she was sort of just auditioning for the for the president. And it was one of these, you know, argument with um, Chris Cuomo show Cuomo's court or something. And so I looked her up and I was like, what? Is, I can't figure out what she's done. Everything is very vague and nonspecific. And and I but I realized, you know, at one point she was criticizing a judge who some federal judge had issued a ruling that she didn't like. I think it was the judge on the McGahn case, um, Kentaji uh, uh, Brown Jackson in, in D.C., who I had praised. I, I went and watched that proceeding. I covered it for CNN, and I said she was extremely well-prepared and thorough and controlled her courtroom. And Jenna Ellis jumped in and said something like, oh, of course, well, she's an Obama judge. And I said something like, I said, well, look, I don't know how many federal judges you've ever appeared in front of, but I've been in front of at least, uh, you know, 50. And she went, not, that's a personal attack. That's a personal attack. I said, I, not a personal attack. I just, that's I said, a I don't, professional attack. I said, I don't know how many judges you've appeared in front of. Maybe it's a lot. I knew it was zero, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not personal. That's professional. Yeah. That's just business, yeah, Jenna. Exactly. <laughs> oh, goodness. Anyway. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Maybe, maybe some, her, maybe her bar license is in jeopardy. All these frivolous lawsuits are ridiculous. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. Everybody check out the book Hatchet. Man, you can get it on Amazon now. The only Ellie Honig on the planet, <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna speculate that that's true. Yep. Uh, but thank you for for joining me to talk about Barr's departure today. Uh, former federal state prosecutor Ellie Honig, thank you. Thanks, AJ. Talk to you soon.
Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with Frank Figaluzzi, and we're going to talk about the dangerous, violent rhetoric from the far right. Stay with us. Hey, everybody. This is AG from The Daily Beans, and this segment of the podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp, amazing people providing the very best in professional counseling. Life is always throwing curveballs at us. This is a very hard time right now. It feels like every day there's some daunting new challenge to face. The important thing to remember is you don't have to do it alone. So if you're struggling with anything that's preventing you from living your best life, I recommend BetterHelp. It's not a crisis line. It is not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. They'll assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start talking to them in less than 24 hours. You know I've had my own struggles dealing with PTSD, and I know how important it is to seek help. It's so much better than trying to face it alone. And BetterHelp services are available for clients worldwide, and they have a broad range of experts in their network that might not be available in your area, but they are here because the best thing about BetterHelp is you can log in from anytime and anywhere. You can send a message to your counselor, and you get timely and thoughtful responses, and you can schedule weekly in phone and video sessions, too. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change your counselor if you need to. That's amazing. And it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and they have financial aid visit their website and read their testimonials like this one from user br who says dana was so great i only did a month but she was very helpful she gave me lots of new coping skills and tricks i can use to keep after uh to keep using after counseling has ended and i feel like i've really grown as a person during my month on this app i'll continue working on myself and using the skills she gave me so visit betterhelp.com slash daily beans that's betterhelp h-e-l-p and you can join the over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional special offer for daily beans listeners you get 10 percent off your first month that's betterhelp.com slash daily beans all right here we go this is frank figalusi for the c block um december 8th uh safe harbor day happy safe harbor day okay here we go in three two all right everybody welcome back Quote, we saw a dangerous dialogue launched from the lips of people with advanced degrees, such as Juris Doctorate and Master of Divinity. Those radicalized professionals held or still hold impressive titles like U.S. Attorney, Appellate Section Chief, U.S. Senator, Congressman, and Lieutenant Colonel, and Chaplain in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. This was the week that further confirmed how radicalized we've become as a nation and how much closer we are to the moment when treacherous talk turns into violent reality. That is from a new piece for MSNBC Daily, written by former assistant director of the FBI for counterintelligence. And he's here to talk to us more about that. It's Frank Fagaluzzi. Frank, welcome back. Always a pleasure at least to talk, if not to theorize about how bad things are, Allison. It's good to speak to you, too. Yes, always a pleasure, not necessarily the content of the conversation, but that we have them. I appreciate you talking to us today about this because this is um, it's getting it's getting really bad. Can you talk a little bit about um, that opening uh, quote and, and some of some of the thoughts that you're having about the rhetoric that we're hearing and, and the damage that it's doing? Yeah, I just I felt compelled to write this, Allison, because over the course of the last week or, or two weeks, really, we've seen some things that got got my attention and specifically that point to very, very volatile rhetoric coming from people it really shouldn't come from. And by that, I mean, when when people in suits who have advanced degrees, law degrees, serve in Congress or have been serving in Congress or have a master's of divinity degree and serve as, still serve as chaplain in the military, when they are spouting the words of hate, the words of radicalization, the words that I know from a career in the FBI, will inevitably lead to violence. It's time to call that out because um, it means that violence and violent rhetoric are becoming mainstreamed in our society. Now, a lot of folks, um, in fact, I've been contacted by folks who said, what, you just first figured this out now, Frank? And and my response to that is, no, no, I, I've, I've known this for a long time. I In my career, um, early, early in my career, they sent this Connecticut Yankee down to Atlanta, Georgia in the FBI. And I, I worked the Klan. I worked cross burnings and Klan rallies. So I've seen entrenched hate um, mainstreamed. But, but let's fast forward to today and the election results and the reality that we can no longer point to a so-called fringe lunatic group. We can't say that, oh, these people who shoot up places like the Walmart or 
or the kid in the Kenosha shooting or the El Paso Walmart shooting. We can't say, oh, these are troubled youth. They got radicalized online. They had troubled families. No, we. what did we see in the last two weeks? Um, a Trump lawyer, Joe DeGeneva, calling for Chris Krebs to be shot at dawn and drawn and quartered. We, we saw uh, um, a, a former U.S. Senator, Doug Collins, current congressman out of Georgia, current Navy Reserve, excuse me, Air Force Reserve chaplain, saying that um, Reverend Ralph uh, Raphael Warnack, who's running for Senate in Georgia, who happens to be a pro-choice pastor, um, Collins says that's that can't happen. You can't be a pro-choice pastor. That, quote, is a lie from the pit of hell, unquote. So when you see the demonization of the other side, when you see people calling for someone you disagree with to be killed or being called out as a devil or coming from hell, you, are, you have to understand from a radicalization standpoint, we are now at the verge of a flashpoint where people, the next logical step after thinking someone is, is the devil, your adversary um, is, it poses an existential threat, the next logical step is violence. Yeah, and we have people like General Flynn, uh, former, uh, I guess, retired General Flynn, uh, calling for martial law uh, before his case is even dismissed after receiving his pardon. But we see this sort of manifesting in all, all kinds of different ways. If you know, we remember the attempt to kidnap and execute Governor Gretchen Whitmer, uh, you know, in Michigan, and the armed uprising at the state house there. Just today, we've got a couple of stories that that are are bearing this out. You know, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, she was putting up Christmas lights with her, and she was hanging out with her kids. And there were two dozen armed protesters chanting "Stop the steal," and another horrible, terrible things outside of her home. And she decided to, you know, I mean, what could she do? I mean, she's put out some statements, but this this is the kind of thing that that is manifesting from this rhetoric. We've got people like uh, the fired head of the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, Chris Krebs, who are being uh, there's calls for his execution. Why? Because he was doing his job. Why Why are people at the home of, of the Michigan Secretary of State? She was doing her job. Um, why are people calling um, Reverend um, Warnock in Georgia a lie from the pit of hell? He's running for office. So, you know, what what, what is essentially happening here is the truth is becoming the enemy. The truth is because if you speak the truth, if you speak your opinion and have data behind it, whether it's the COVID virus or whether it's the outcome of a presidential election, you are now subject to death threats. We, we all, we've all seen what's going on in Georgia, um, young election staffers um, in the state offices uh, threatened with death. Um, the, 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 the Georgia governor, the Georgia Secretary of State, the Georgia head of elections, all subject to threats. FBI has stepped in to investigate those threats. Why? Because people are doing their jobs and their opinion differs from you. And they've been painted, they've been painted as the enemy, the adversary, as posing an existential threat. And here's here's um here's the thing about about this from the lessons we've learned with counterterrorism and counter radicalization. The danger spot we're in now is there's a natural human tendency to want to match rhetoric with rhetoric. So the more someone ratchets up, the more violent they sound, the more threatening they are, there's a there's a often a natural human inclination to match that, you know, whether it's a shouting match or whether the words are as strong or, you know, it's time for us to view somebody as an existential threat to us. And and I'm here to say that's the wrong approach because what what's going to happen is it's going to paint evil against evil. It's going to see, you know, adversary against adversary. And that will expedite how quickly we move to violence. If you want a model of, of how to do the right thing, look at a guy by the name of Joe Biden, because whether he's doing this naturally or someone's advising him, his calmness, his demeanor in the face of all of this, is precisely what you would do um, when faced with a hostile combatant. 
and he's he's doing it right so far so good agreed and you know you speak about uh people just doing their jobs um you know for example we had what was it uh, steve bannon call for the beheading of dr anthony fauci who has also received numerous death threats and has to have a security detail because he's doing his job to to save lives and and today this is a developing story frank uh this is from rebecca jones uh her twitter account, her Twitter feed. She was the woman that was working at the, I believe, the Department of Health. And this is a developing story, so forgive me if I get any of these details wrong. But she she was, she was, is a scientist. She was working at the Department of Health in Florida. She was reporting the COVID numbers on their database. And she was told to falsify those numbers or not report the correct numbers. And she refused to do so. She was fired. And so she started doing so from her home. And she posted today uh, on Twitter, there will be no update today. At 8.30 a.m., state police came into my house, took all my hardware and tech. They were serving a warrant on my computer after Department of Health filed a complaint. They pointed a gun in my face. They pointed guns at my children. They took my phone and the computer I use every day to post the case numbers in Florida and school cases for the entire country. They took evidence of corruption at the they took evidence of corruption at the state level. They claimed it was about a security breach. She says this was DeSantis. He sent the Gestapo. This is what happens to scientists who do their job honestly. This is what happens to people who speak truth to power. I tell them my husband and my two children are upstairs. Then one of them, then one of them draws his gun on my children. This is DeSantis's Florida. She says I'll have a new computer tomorrow, and then I'm going to get back to work. If you want to help, my website is still is here. And she gives her website, FloridaCovidAction.com. That happened to her family this morning. All right. So this is this is an extension of the column we've just been talking about, which is that it's not just people in suits and ties. It's not just people with law degrees or masters of divinity degrees or those who serve in Congress. It's now people acting as an arm of the state. They are an arm of the state in in police uniforms being sent by those in power who want to harass and threaten somebody who was simply doing her job. Now, could there be some security violation? Is she accessing some state records? Is she working entirely off of public information only? Or, you know, is is she privy to things that are considered to be proprietary to the state? We may never know because because this governor of Florida is simply not interested in the truth. He's interested in suppressing it. And because this pandemic has turned political, we now have political drivers and political motivations for everything that happens. And the mixture of, just to kind of bring this now all together, as I talk about in the column, the mixture of politics, the mixture of religion, and, and the thought that Um, One party or one candidate has the sole right to God's favor, um, as we saw with Collins lambasting uh, Warnock, as we saw also this past week with Michelle Bachman, um, who uh, was—there's a video clip of her praying to God um, that somehow the Trump victory will will out— um, because you know that's what that's that's the only candidate God could possibly want, right? When you mix that religious fervor with the adamance that everyone else poses an existential threat to you, you bring down the state in terms of state troopers in Florida raiding somebody's house. Um, we, we we will not recover easily from this. We just will not. And my concern is this is headed down a path toward violence. Yeah, and and. <laughs> The Miami Herald's now picked up uh, the story. So I think it'll get more widely reported. We'll have a little better idea uh, as the details come into view. But it's terrifying. It's just it's something out of a movie script from another century in another country. And, uh, you know, uh, you you brought up the calm demeanor of the president elect. Uh, What else can we do? So and I boy, to to further illustrate how close we are to a flashpoint, I will say that my column in a subsequent interview I did on uh, MSNBC yesterday um, drew uh, criticism from both sides. And, and that's okay. I'm, I'm used to that. But the nature of some of the criticism 
was uh, from the left was based on the fact that I had the audacity to imply that it's not just the right wing that has locked up um, this notion that everything is an ex is an existential threat and that everybody's evil, right? And and so I took a hit for that from people saying, no, 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 no. It's it's only the far right. It's only the far right that's that's claiming um, we're evil. And and, and, I, and I go, you know, that's not. Come on. That that's not entirely true. Now I will say that I I cannot think of death threats be, being um, being lobbied uh, lobbed um, at people from the left toward the right. But I have seen some pretty ugly stuff with regard to gee I hope this guy dies of COVID or you know this guy is going is 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 going to destroy um, the country and will never ever recover. I mean anytime you paint something as a total existential threat and total evil, you you are falling into the same trench that the other side is falling into. So when you ask, what is it we can do? The first thing I recommend is don't fall into that trap. Do what Biden, you know, what would Joe do? Do what Biden is doing right now, which is he's being extremely calm and extremely measured. Do what FBI hostage negotiators are trained to do when someone's barricaded and holding a hostage uh, at gunpoint, if the guy starts screaming and ranting and going off the, you know, going crazy, it's not your, that doesn't mean it's you need to do that. In fact, that's the worst thing you could do is match that violent rhetoric and threat. So take a breath, be calm, refuse to match that rhetoric, recognize the threat for what it is. Um, and I get torn on this all the time. I, I'm I, I in the same day, Allison. I'll say my network shouldn't be covering this at all. Don't I don't I don't want to hear about Ted Cruz saying that somebody's taking his Thanksgiving away from him. Don't don't cover it. Um, and then I realize now. Wait a minute. There's important security value to understanding how bad this is getting. So. The, a balance has to be struck. Like the, the social media today is all lit up on, hey, Trump is threatening to have on inauguration day, he's going to take Air Force One, fly to Florida and have a big announcement about running again. Right. And there's people saying, don't cover it. Don't cover it. OK. And I get that. But from as a security professional, I have to tell you, I need to know that he's doing that because it's going to continue for the next four years where we have a guy with 70 million people who voted for him, a huge Twitter following, and we got to figure out what he's doing from a threat perspective. Well, I appreciate you giving us the, those pieces of advice. It's it's hard. It's really hard to kind of uh, come to grips that this that this is what's happening. Um, and you know, like you said, from from people in suits, people with degrees, uh, chaplains in the Air Force, um, it's it's mind blowing. So I guess. I guess we just, you know, heads down, stay calm and uh, wait it out for, you know, and and just keep just, I guess, right. Keep our heads down. Yeah, it's it's uh, see it for what it is. Dangerous uh, madness um, and treat it extremely gingerly. Call it out when you see it and then disregard. So I've I, I have a personal mission in my own circle of um, family, friends, acquaintances, or even in social media. If I see utter nonsense and non-factual data put out, like I, it happened um, yesterday, um, a, a family member sent me something from a, a more distant uh, connection where this person was saying, look, the vaccine is going to cause sterility in women. And, and by the way, this was another educated person, actually someone in the medical profession. And and I said, you've got to be kidding me. So it took me about 10 seconds to, to Google what's going on with that nonsense and send these folks everything I could find on how this notion came to be, how the language was all screwed up and, you know, um, and, and, and put it down. So take that on, be fact based, provide facts to people, but don't but don't get caught up in this r rhetorical um fist fight where you're going to end up in the same gutter as the folks who are headed to violence. Yep. Good point. Well, thank you very much. Uh, everybody check out the piece. It's on MSNBC Daily. Uh, and I appreciate your time, former Assistant Director, FBI for Counterintelligence 
MSNBC legal analyst Frank Figaluzzi. Thanks for joining me today. Anytime, Allison. Thank you. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, everybody, it's AG. Thanks for supporting The Daily Beans. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by Field of Greens by Brickhouse Nutrition. The pandemic hasn't just tested our economic endurance. It's also exposed how we have to keep our immune system strong. And that's why I recommend you take this superfood powder. It's called Field of Greens by Brickhouse Nutrition, and you do it every day. While other health products boast about one vegetable, Field of Greens has 18 clinically researched essential fruits and vegetables, plus green tea, ginger, turmeric, and beets. And this powerful combination not only supports heart health, it can support a healthy immune system, a healthy metabolism, good blood pressure and digestion. Field of Greens is loaded with antioxidants, pre and probiotics. You just put one scoop in a glass of water, stir, and you're done. So why settle for one vegetable when you can have the entire Field of Greens? Besides, nothing goes better with your daily beans than a Field of Greens. And Field of Greens, uh, add it to your daily Daily routine and see why their powdered greens have earned over 2,000 five-star reviews. Go to fieldofgreens15.com and get 15% off your first order with the promo code BEANS at checkout. So you got to go to fieldofgreens1515, fieldofgreens15.com, and then use BEANS at checkout. Available in two flavors, regular and wild berry. Both taste amazing. One more time, fieldofgreens15.com, and don't forget promo code BEANS. All right, everybody, welcome back. It is a good news segment. You've earned it. We need it today so badly. <laughs> I know. God, that, there was a lot. There was a lot, people. Uh, all right, I'm going to kick this off. We have a piece of uh, good news, a submission here from Becca, and Becca's pronouns are she and her, and Becca says, hello, thank you for helping me keep saying all year. You're welcome. I started listening to MSW after AG was a guest on Getting Curious with JVN. This is a lot of initials, and I've been listening ever <laughs> since. It's like we're in the military. It's like this podcast is run by somebody who worked for the government. I'm so excited for the Daily Beans to continue into the Biden administration, but hopefully there won't be as much news every day, or at least not scary news, and hopefully a lot more good and happy news. Yes, Becca, I want to bring back the Fantasy Indictment League. I'm with you. Anyway, on to my good news. I was laid off from my job in April. I've spent the last eight months job hunting, and I have finally found a new job. Yay. I started this past Monday, and I'm liking it so far. I wrote in earlier in the summer about an organizing pro- uh, organizing a protest in Columbus, Ohio, during the first week after the George Floyd killing. I'm honestly grateful that I was unemployed at that point in time because I became even more involved in organizing and activism during my time being out of work. Listening to your podcast and completely immersing myself in trying to make the world a better place has made me realize that I definitely want to go into politics someday. Uh, I have some things I need to accomplish on my own before I can do that, but I hope to run for public office at some point during this decade. Thank you for all that you do and for inspiring this raggedy 20-something the past couple of years to want to make our country and world a better place. I'm grateful for all that you do and for helping me keep up with what's going on in the world around us. Attached are pictures of my pups, Jax and Brody. Great names. Jax is the husky. Brody is the golden doodle. They're wearing their super cute BLM and RBG bandanas. Oh, my goodness. <gasps> Look at these babies. Man. I love doodles. Golden doodles. They're like Muppets. canine gunned stuffed animals. That's what they are. These like gun just they're just the softest things on the planet. Mm, and look so at these sweet. Babies. They're smiling. They're both smiling. Jax is cute. <laughs> so good. Oh, they really are smiling. <sighs> oh, I need an animal. All right. This next good news <laughs> this next good news comes from Ellen, pronouns she and her. I'm sending a picture of my adorable cat, Ghosty, hiding among the presents under my Christmas tree. Full disclosure, this was last Christmas. I'll be going into the National Forest with a permit and sawzall. All right, a sawzall. And a sawzall must be a type of saw. Good Lord, I'm a bad lesbian. Mm-hmm. A sawzall to get this year's tree tomorrow. Thank you for the I have many- a sawzall. Yeah, of Dana, course you, you don't do. have a sawzall? I know, mm-hmm. I need a sawzall. Does, does, Sawzall, does Sawzall sponsor you? I'll take a Sawzall. <laughs> we should write to Sawzall. Hey, dear Sawzall. <laughs> it's just fun to say. Okay, so Ellen's going to be going into the forest with her Sawzall to get this year's Christmas tree. Thank you for the many hours of a reality checking in righteous fury. And now mm. the big sigh of relief. <sighs> I'm confident mm. that help and hope are on the way. And I'll continue to listen because Biden is better, so much better, but there's always room for improvement. I was a quality assurance specialist. 
<laughs> look at ghosty oh the kitty kitty in the tree store nice present stack there ag ag did you i'm just I mean, you don't have to get into the story it's just i'm mentioning it that someone found a koala bear in their christmas tree when they brought it home holy shit and it had to get saved um and it was just like these two elderly people came and saved the and i say elderly because they were like in their 70s it looked like but they came and saved the koala bear uh from the tree <laughs> Um, but I don't understand how you wouldn't have noticed, like getting it out of the, t- the tree lot or cutting it down, putting it in the car. Anyway, I have so many questions. If anyone has any answers to that, please let us know. I have questions. First of all, was your Christmas tree a eucalyptus tree? What is a koala doing in a pine, in a coniferous pine tree? That's a great question. And it's perhaps why no one thought to look for the koala before they brought it home. No. Yeah. I would not look for koalas in in my coniferous, non-deciduous tree. I would not. Exactly. Well, I'm glad that the koala is okay and no koalas were harmed in the making of this good news segment. Next up, they, them, anonymity, please. Forgive me, Leguminati, for I've sinned deliciously. Uh, On a complete whim, I decided to tell a person how I felt about them, and the feeling was mutual. I wonder if this is, no, this is probably different from our Starbucks person because we have a Starbucks uh, person who writes in about his barista and and, and I haven't heard from them in a while. So uh, right in um, you. So now, so after some logistics, back to, back to they, them, anonymity, please. Feeling was mutual. After some logistics and a long drive later, a decade long dry spell of sorts was ended in spectacular fashion. To say that the sex was great would be to imply that the ocean is damp and the Pope is Catholic. (laughs) Five out of five stars, would bang again, would recommend to a friend. Holy shit. A week later, I'm still blushing. My face hurts from smiling, and I get a little giddy and lightheaded just thinking about them. Being bi, I'm only half lesbian, so I get to play a well-rounded game of game show voice. Don't catch feelings. (laughs) Our first contestant is a hopeless romantic. Let's see if they can come out of this with their heart unscathed. Come on down. Okay. Well done, AG. Thank you. Please pray for me, but I might just be beyond saving. Included is a picture of my youngest on a drum kit for your oohs and ahs. Oh, Oh, man. I also miss my drum kit. I would take both of those things. I'd take the drum kit and I'd take that little cutie. This is an adorable little blonde angel rocking the pacifier and the drumsticks the drumsticks as tall as she yes and and the pacifier and just sitting at that lovely lovely set of drums that's beautiful all right i love that i miss i really do miss my drums i I, girls on drums they're the best they're the best all right this next one is from eogenio pronouns he him hey asshole there you go (laughs) those are the pronouns Uh, Hi, new patron here. I'm from Italy. Lived 20 years in Britain with my wife. Left late last year because of Brexit. And now I'm based in the Netherlands where I continue to work in the field of cybersecurity. Oh, five eyes. Interesting. I've been following you on and off since the early days of Mueller. She wrote, there was a weird comma, so I (laughs) I read that with a weird comma. (laughs) Mueller. She She wrote, and I have to thank you for shedding some light on an otherwise incomprehensible world of U.S. politics. I agree. Before you, all I knew about it came from the West Wing, which I am beginning to realize was a slightly optimistic take on things. <laughs> I I watch it. It's porn. It's poli- It's politics porn for me. I watch oh it all the time. Oh my God, that's fantastic. I have a couple of items that qualify as good news. First, contrary to the initial assessment, my collapsed... Oh, Jesus. Contrary to the initial assessment, my collapsed lung lobe was just a temporary, albeit long-term, consequence of the COVID I caught in March. It's not lung cancer, and it's not permanent damage caused by interstitial pneumonia. Yay! Oh my God, these stories where people have to find damage to their lungs is good news because it's not pneumonia. I'm so angry at at this fucking administration. Sorry, that was just my interlude. Uh, Back to the good news. Uh, Second, my wife and I have been working from home since March and in the free time, we finished our first novel. Wife is already a published author back in Italy. Uh, Essays, this is her first fiction work. So she's looking for an agent in an English speaking world for the novel. The sense of accomplishment for something like this is huge. Mm. Adding mm-hmm. a few picks for the pet tax. The white lady is Bukadika, AA, mm-hmm. aka Miss Chonquette. Mm-hmm. Oh, Budika, not Bukadika. Mm-hmm. I just made her different. It's Budika. 
or Budicha? Ah, Budicha, because it's Italian. Oh my God. Mm. I'm so embarrassed. Thank you for not having to <laughs> write in and correct me. Look at me, just a phon- phonetic. It's a, it's a Boudica. It's Boudica. <laughs> it's Budicha. It's Bodega. It's the Bo- Bodega cat. <laughs> Otherwise known as Miss Chunkat. The black guy is her brother, Cesar. Look how good that was. <laughs> AKA Chanko. McChonky face. Chonko McChonky mm. face. The tabby dude is Harry Potter the squatter. The tiny mm. baby is Roxalana. Mm. I feel good about that one. Rescued from mm-hmm. a fox attack when she was <gasps> two days old. Look at these. Okay. <gasps> there's... No, E.G., oh. the kitten. I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not oh, there yet. Get there. <laughs> okay. Here I come. Here I come. Oh, look at the look at the chonk. Look at the void chonk with the belly. and Oh, nip nops. Oh my god, you're the kitten. <laughs> Do you know how hard it was for me to wait for you to get there? And I never say that to women. It was so hard for me to wait for you to get to that kitten. <laughs> Look at the tummy and the oh feet. My goodness. Oh, the oh I just want to do like the little finger scratch in the chest where the, the paws come mm-hmm. in and then they go back out. Mm-hmm. And then they yeah, come and in they and then they go back out. Yeah. Yep. E. Oh my gosh. Thank you for this. Thank you so much for this. Uh, Eugenio. That's amazing. Okay. Ah, oh, thank you, beautiful. Next up from Anonymous, just wanted to drop a quick note to thank you for putting the Ten Bulls song on the last patron newsletter link that hit all the spots. The entire album is freaking amazing. Longtime listener, you complete me, etc. Ah. Uh, oh, by the way, there's some context here from, from our production assistant. All of the newsletter links and happy hour links need an audio file attached to be uploaded to the Patreon and Supercast feed. Usually, it's the Beans theme, but sometimes that audio is a song from a super rad band. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so that thank you is for Kanai. All right. We've got this one's coming from Scarecrow. No pronouns given. Hello, Beans team. My seasonal job is playing a nutcracker at our local amusement park for the holiday season. I'm also a haunt actor for Halloween. Unfortunately, both events were canceled this year. Another COVID casualty. It was a huge emotional blow to me, performing as this character, being with people who are so happy to see me, and just enjoying the beauty of the park. Done up in three million lights is highly addictive. In the nine years we've done the event, I've never missed a night. A few weeks ago, my boss at the park contacted me. Our local zoo decided that they would make a drive through zoo lights display and were interested in using some of the park's costumes. Uh, since I had made them, it was up to me to loan them out. Turns out they also wanted me to perform as my nutcracker and were willing to pay me nearly three times my park rate. Yes. Mm. Beginning last Friday and running through January 3rd, I get to be an eight foot tall nutcracker with a flowing rainbow LED staff. It isn't quite the same, but it's close as we're going to get this year. And it was fun to hear people calling out to me when they recognized me from the park. There's a photo below. Um, with their co-workers, Romaine and Penguin and Frosty. A few weeks ago, I sent a photo of Carol, my Captain Marvel chicken. <laughs> <laughs> She's an Americana and likes the Easter eggers. And like the mm. Easter eggers, she also lays green eggs. Oh. Huh. This week's chicken is the Jersey Giant, one of the largest commercial breeds. It was the only survivor of six after raccoons tore the wooden side off their pen. Oh my God. Jeez, raccoons are crazy and attack them. Uh, I also want to say raccoons are also freaking awesome, but I think they can, you know, if they're chill out get to though, the, with chickens, the chickens they want to get to the chickens raccoons freak me out because they can grab onto things like a, like a human uh mm. for a long time it was hard to tell if i was if it was going to be a rooster or a hen if it had been a hen it would have been named allison after allison janney another tall funny white chick alas it turns out to be a rooster my friend's five-year-old daughter named him calling him pete it's spelled p-e-e-t p-e-t P-E-E-T. Good Lord. It's called, P- his name's Pete. Okay, people? And it's spelled P-E-E-T because that's how a bird would spell it. Oh my God, kids oh, are adorable. Cute. Five-year-olds are so cute. Thank you for all your hard work. You're all amazing. And this picture is fantastic. <laughs> I would love to be one of these people just for the holidays. <laughs> I know. I'm wondering what park and what zoo this is. I'm wondering if this is hometown, San Diego here. Ew. 
I don't know, because we have a Halloween haunt. I mean, most cities do. Yeah. Look at that chicken. That is a huge cock. That is a mm. big, big chicken. <gasps> that is a big chicken. <laughs> Sorry. This the word. I don't know the word. It's <laughs> the word got. I didn't expect it. <laughs> I hit you with a surprise oh, cock. You and did. It made you hit you. me with a surprise <laughs> cock, and I have the worst gag reflex on the history of the planet my tongue scraper elicits it <laughs> okay. oh yeah mine too i i i can't it's like hard i'm like oh here huh this has to do this yeah i used to be like when i was younger uh and i had to take nyquil i'd have to like get in front of the mirror and like psych myself up like here we go <laughs> you know i hated it and it would be awful that's how i am with my tongue scraper oh, God. but now you know after college and jägermeister nyquil is like man shoot but uh yeah, I'm I'm familiar with that feeling. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. All right. Any final thoughts before we get out here? Thank you so much, everybody, for submitting your good news. If you have any to submit, please do so. And if uh, of course on Fridays we're now we're we're holding Amy's court. So if you have any uh, disputes you need settled in your in your household, uh, send those in as well. You can do that at dailybeanspod.com by clicking contact. Nice. And uh, I just, you're hearing it here for the first time. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a show at the end of the year. I decided to do an end of the year um, show. It's going to be virtual. It'll be a long set and I'll have more information on that. AG, I I think I'm going to do it for New Year's Eve. There's a lot of us that are stuck in our homes and there's a lot of single people out there listening that may not have a lovely person to cuddle that night. And so they may want some company uh, virtually. And so uh, it's either going to be New Year's Eve or the 30th, but I'll have more information on that as the weeks go by. So if you'd like to tune in and uh, listen, then you can help put the shit show of a year behind us together. With laughs. Yes. And I feel seen I, because that's going to be me. So I definitely want to see this show too. So yeah, I look forward to those details. And everybody else will be back tomorrow. Until then, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, take care of the planet, and take care of your mental health. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is executive produced and directed by AG and Jordan Coburn and engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Industries. Our marketing manager, executive assistant, production and social media direction is Amanda Reeder. Fact-checking and research by AG, Jordan Coburn, and Amanda Reeder. Our music is written and performed by They Might Be Giants. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our website is dailybeanspod.com. <laughs>